Hello everyone and welcome to talks number three. Today we have with us Merv. He's from Turkey and works for I am why I am, which was very difficult for me to pronounce. <laughs> But and she's working in conversational AI for a long time now. And today she's going to talk about conversational AI chatbots. And by the end of the talk, we will be able to build our own bots. Right, Merv? Yeah. If it's beginner and intermediate, it would not be that bad. About um, from scratch, and also it contains some of the know-hows I gained from not having a senior around here. I, I have done some benchmarking and stuff, and I want to share what I actually know. Yeah. Very excited to learn. Looking forward to the talk. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the YouTube chat or the Slido link that I will be sharing, and uh, we can interrupt you and ask questions, right? Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Then Please do. Without further ado, the screen is all yours. Okay. Let me share my. So today I'm going to talk a bit about conversational AI. Uh, if you don't know about me, I've been doing chatbots for a living for two years, over two years, I guess. Uh, I am a contributor at Raza, which is a chatbot framework, and I'm a Google Developer Expert in machine learning. And so far, I have done two chatbots. Um, below, I I am seeing some. Uh, let me let me keep this uh, down. Yeah. So so far, I have done two uh, chatbots. One for one was for um, automation of uh, service companies chatbots. Like there are few actions that um, that Live Supports actually do. It's like um, Canceling appointment, rescheduling appointment, or scheduling one, so it's easy to automate. And your uh, domain is really narrow. Your world, the world you are working in, is really narrow. Your the the words that your customers are going to end user is going to use is very narrow. That's why it's relatively easy to make. And I have also made this uh, real field friend we call uh, called Sid. It is more of a friend like. Chatbot like replica, but it's more. Um, it's 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 not. It doesn't use um, generator models. Um, it is more uh, focused on health and health-based applications. So I'm going to talk about the difference between two and how to make your own. What are the different best practices on making them? Um, but. For starters, conversational is the set of technologies behind automated um, automated messaging and speech enabled applications. Chatbot is just a um, uh, subdomain of uh, conversational AI. There are Siri, Alexa, Google Home, uh, most popular ones, and there are chatbots. And chatbots do have levels. Uh, first level is uh, notification assistance, which is just like an SMS that you get or like a push notification that you cannot answer. It just it's it just talks to you, but it doesn't you you cannot talk back. Um, second level of conversational assistance is the FAQ assistance. I'm sorry, the birds are just <laughs> passing. Uh, FAQ assistance, which is more like um, it doesn't provide you a personal experience. Uh, you are just going to ask a question, and there is this KB in the in the back end, and it's going to extract the answer and send it back to you, or you can define the answers to those questions. This is basic natural language understanding, um, you know, question answering application. Um, it doesn't really provide you a personalized experience. And the level three, which is what we are currently on, is providing you a assistance that is personalized and customized for you and your uh, background of that service of that website. It is going to, like, you are going to ask, I need to renew my renter's insurance, how much will it be? And it is going to ask you a couple of questions or it is going to get some information from the back end and just going to calculate something for you and return it back to you. Uh, so this is a bit more personal. 
And there are a few use cases, like you can use it for marketing, uh, you can use it for robotic process automation, which is, I feel like it's the mo it's mostly used for robotic pro process automation. Uh, you can just, you know, book a flight or you can, uh, you can cancel your cancel your flight. You can do a check in. Like KLM uses Facebook Messenger, for instance. Uh, it it's also going to provide you a personal experience based on where you are going to fly. For instance, like there is Expedia spot. If you are flying to Barcelona, for instance, it's going to provide you this uh, place recommendations, like restaurant, hotel recommendations, based on where you are flying. Uh, there are also banking bots, uh, which is mostly like the, the wi widest use case I have seen of conversational AI is in banks. Um, I have also seen some, you know, e-commerce websites around here at least um, using uh, chatbots. Most people call chatbots um, like bots with buttons chatbots but it's actually it's not right because you cannot talk to it uh so not every chatbot in my opinion is actually a chatbot because most of them are actually you know redirecting you through buttons and stuff and you cannot express yourself and what is your problem which is actually annoying uh there are you know food ordering bots and stuff but the, where does the machine learning come in it's mostly the intent recognition entity recognition tasks that are going that i'm going to express explain later do not panic if you don't understand this uh, you probably don't have any idea uh there is dialogue management ai and rule-based systems come in you know you extract some information and there are generated models that you can actually use but what is intent recognition so um there are are you going to say something of check so I, I was, yeah uh, um, there are, there are some people in the chat they are concerned uh -huh. about the cat is that your cat it might fall down oh <laughs> Kedish. she's yes she never falls down she is like this really balanced <laughs> balanced creature uh, so she's she's a bit weird yeah <laughs> Hope not. So uh, one question that uh, I had was uh, mm -hmm. the difference between chatbots and conversational AI and why there are so many different kinds of terms going around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so conversational AI is this wide, um, wide domain of different technologies, but it generally means that you are actually speaking to that bot or technology you are expressing yourself it understands you and talks back to you it's that's why you know speech tech uh, like uh, Siri Alexa are also under conversational AI but chatbots is mostly you talk like you type something and it chats and it talks back to you uh, the reason why they are called all conversational AI is, I feel like it's mostly because they understand you and in the background they are going to automate some stuff. So uh, like the bot part, I guess, comes from there because it automates things like RPA, you know. But I mean, there is probably a philosophical thing, but this is a definition I have found is a set of technologies behind automated messaging and speech enabled applications that offer human like interactions between computers and humans. So we talk, I guess. So they but some of like, these, huh? they, understand, yeah. they understand the context, they understand uh, uh, different uh, entities. That you're yeah. talking about, right? Yeah. But the you know, like the button chatbots, I mean all button chatbots are though I don't think that they are actually conversational agents. Yeah. <laughs> but this, that's an opinion and it's completely com controversial, and I don't want anyone to be offended. Like if your button 
but is actually working, then it's fine. But most of the time, it just doesn't work. I just can't express myself, and my use case is usually different. So, and it doesn't even let me express my um, my my problem, my trouble with that service or whatsoever. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> So intent recognition is actually a task uh, that is solved uh, in chatbots. Intent recognition is basically that you your bot is trying to understand the what you are talking about. Uh, it's like, for instance, you say, show me a Mexican place in the center. And what you are going to do is you are, you, what your bot is going to do is to, you know, extract uh, extract a Mexican restaurant in the city center uh, from the back end and prompt it back to your user so that you, they can do whatever they want. But there is tons of different ways to say, show me a Mexican place in the center. And these all have some common um, way of saying it. Um, you don't need to define every single way uh, that the user has to say and do it rule in a rule-based way you just define an intent called restaurant search and below that you have your examples think about them like training example it's every single way that user can say it but it can extrapolate when the user says something different out of your training data so that's where machine learning comes in and these uh, mexican and the center are actually uh, the the entities that you need to extract from that conversation the context that you are you want to get so that you can actually send them to backend and get the information that the user wants. So these are this can be considered as entities. And what you mean here, like I could have made it, um, I don't know, a generated model. But your domain is very narrow, and in your domain, Italian means something different than the nationality, or Mexican means something different than nationality. It means uh, the cuisine of that nationality. It's different. That's why you define your entities one by one, and each of the entities match something in your backend and that you are trying to get. So this is also called slot filling. You have some slots to provide service for the uh, user, and those slots are filled with the entities that you are recognizing from the user's input. So when you when the user says, "Show me a Mexican uh, restaurant in the city center," you take those entities, the center and the Mexican, and then send it to backend and get something back, and then just prompt it. And there is named entity recognition which is a quite popular task uh i can never define named entities by the way like there is these are entities that are unique i would say like um in here google is the organization obviously uh that's why it is called named entities abhishek do you have any idea how to express named entity from uh, you know like different than an entity i always say it's unique but i don't think that my definition is awesome <laughs> okay so named entities are the entities that you want to extract also you know your email address your phone number your you know, a date is a named entity that you want to extract and uh, you can extract them through named entity recognition models. Also, there is this, I didn't put this in a slide, but there is this uh, library developed by Facebook called Ducklink that is going to extract uh, emails and stuff so that you don't have to train a whole model to, you know, extract emails because it's hard task to do in my opinion. Uh, these are named entities and you need to just catch that catch them you know if you are going to do a booking or something you need to extract the the uh, dates and time uh also duckling recognizes uh when you say next monday it, it recognizes uh, what date is it actually is mapped to that's very cool in my opinion 
you can use Stacy, you can use that thing, whatever you want to extract named entity, but it's not really so you shouldn't really solve it on your own. That's that's another opinion. <laughs> so another problem we are yeah. We, we have yeah, a question sure. about the data and mm -hmm. um, it's about what are the recommended number of utterances required to train a custom machine learning entity and uh, uh, let's uh, have one, one more question alongside this like uh, okay. since I see that you are using Spacey uh -huh. for named entity recognition and uh -huh. okay this is English language what would you do if you have to uh, if, if you have to work in a different language, since, since in Europe there are so many different kinds of languages being spoken and all over the world, right? So how would you go about building your own custom entity recognition model? How much data would you collect and would you label the data on your own? I mean, I just want to know the thought process there. Yeah. Um... Actually, this is a really cool question. I have never solved it, but currently I my master's thesis is about morphology based language models. And uh, if you it's about questioning if you improve the morphological, you know, parsing part in morphologically rich languages like Turkish, can you improve the named entity recognition task as well? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would say I, if I were going to train it, there are already models out there anyway. Like, I don't know why I would have need to train it, to be honest. Like, some of them are universal, as I have just told you, like, you know, the ones that Duckling can, uh, Duckling can extract, but some of them are, um, you, can, you can get it through with language models, fine-tuned on, Name dentist recognition. You don't have to. I don't think you have to train it, right? I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't train it on my own. I guess. You, are my, you saying what if my, we don't have it or something? Yeah. So my question was like, if I'm working on a language which has very low resource, which doesn't have a, a pre-trained uh, model or pre-trained entity recognition model, or if I'm working in a <coughs> domain, so if I'm building a chatbot for a domain um, that has different kinds of entities than we know about. I mean, these are two different tasks. One is one is the entity recognition and one is named entity recognition. So named in, for named entity recognitions, what I have observed is that uh, you, in, in my in my uh, in, in Turkish, like I, I speak I speak Turkish and work in Turkish. What I have observed is that people actually scrape news because there is a lot of named entities in uh, newspapers, and pe people scrape it and then fine tune, you know, like a birth model on uh, those in, in that data and then just use it. Uh, I don't know about the size of the data, though, but it's 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 not that small. Uh, for the na for the entity recognition uh, part, there are actually a few tips and tricks. Let me just go like this. Like for instance, in here you see, you know, ordering food. Uh, the problem is that when you define too many uh, examples for all of the entities that ex that exists in the world like for instance in my in the chatbot i'm working at the problem is that in health applications like we defined every single food on the earth uh every single action like uh you know yoga we have defined so many things that you know asking you know like defining them in the intent examples itself is actually a hard thing so we have defined few intent examples and we have done lookup entity lookup tables, which actually uh, prevents, which actually helps you not flood your intent examples with entities. Because if you repeat this, uh, you know, like I want to order this, I want to order that, I want to order X, Y, uh, it creates a bias. I'm going to come to this later. Uh, it creates a bias. That's why 
uh, you shouldn't flood your uh, intent data with entities. Instead, you use something called lookup tables, which uh, contains every single uh, entity example and the entity group that it is that it is defined under. That that might be a bit confusing. I'm going to come to this later. It's just I wanted to say it. It doesn't answer your question. I feel like I don't know if I have answered your question. There is one more question and it's about mm -hmm. uh, entity and intent and how they are related to each other. So the question, the exact question is how do you handle an intent that is not, sorry, uh, let's take this one later. The question is, does entity recognition has any impact on intent classification task or are they both completely different? So at the state of art, uh, like Raza uses this dual entity and intent recognition architecture, which is from what I get from the paper, it works like Bayesian. Like when you say it, like mask an entity, like I want to order X uh, or, you know, like I, I want to mask the, not mask the word and then uh, say pizza and like, Given that there is pizza, it's a high probability that the mask word is actually order. Like, think about it like this. It's a bit sort of biasing, in my opinion. It's like, given that the entity is X, what is the probability that intent is Y and the vice versa? I, I don't know if this answered the question. So, like, just, just mask the word... Um, uh, show here if you have it in the training examples and when the if the user is inputting something uh you know like if they make a typo or something for instance in the word show it it is still going to get that intent is actually ordering because you have the word mexican in the center which I, which helps with the uh recognition as well so they are not they are a bit intertwined. Uh, so another thing we need to solve is dialogue management, which is quite hard uh, when it especially when it comes to making a human like friend, because you need to think about every single uh, scenario that the user can type after one another. So for instance, in here the user is saying. Uh, do I still have credit on credit on my account from that refund I got? And you need to answer it. And then, you know, like wait for user to say something and then they are going to say, are you a bot? You know, changing context every, every single turn, but you need to get back to, you know, ordering process again, which is a bit of mix of UX and also, you know, um, they are handling it with, um, you know, state manage state machines and other uh, AI and rule based methods that I'm not going to touch today. Uh, they are um, they are also using transformers in this, by the way, because it, you can have a long sequence of um, of uh, conversation turns. And it's good if you recognize the sequences, so it makes sense to use transformer. Uh, like, like three turns ago, I was going to order something, and then bot got back to it, and then I still changed the context, and uh, the bot needs to understand that you know, cool place the order now thing is actually belonging to the above, um, you know, 15 and a half dollar order, if you know what I mean. So you need to like get back to it. That's why it's, a, it's actually, you know, like you are actually um, getting help from the slots field as well. And the, you know, information from the backend, like this cost this and user has or was going to order this. And when you say, you know, cool placed order now, you need to understand, the bot needs to understand that it is that order, not any other order, if you know what I mean. I, I cannot have a pointer, like I cannot have my mouse. <laughs> I would have been more comfortable. <laughs>
fish of it. Huh? Is my mouse visible? I cannot see it. So like the, the below green place to order now belongs to the above, uh, you know, order is order costs this. Should I place your order? You know, so it, it, it comes back. Uh, so there are a few conversational design choices I have observed. One is for automation bots, one is for question answering bots, and another one is for chat agents like Replica. So automation bots, you can use frameworks like Raza or Google Dialogflow, you know, build your intents and actions, you know, like the intent and what is going to be said or done when that intent is intent has arrived. Uh, they are all based on intents, entities, slots, uh, and the back end. Uh, the other one is, you know, question answering bots. Uh, your slot filling is uh, minimal because you don't really need to um, do much um, ordering and other stuff. You you just um, you, you recognize the entity and you get the you get the information related to that entity. Uh, for the <laughs> chat agents, it's it's generate most of the chat agents are being done by generative models. I'm going to explain why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, so how do you start on making a chat bot? First, you should define your problem. Is it a narrow domain bot like, you know, the, the previous one I have, I have just uh, shown you or the one that I have made for the service companies, you know, scheduling, rescheduling, canceling. I, I call them narrow domain because you don't need to recognize every single word that exists in life. You just need few, uh, few training data. Or are you going to make a friend like bot, which is incredibly challenging? And I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to <laughs> do that. So if it's a narrow domain, but define what you want to automate and see if there is a there is data available. Like I had data previously from the life support in the first bot that I have made. Uh, it is, if you have any, that's actually relatively easy to other tasks. If it's a friend like bot, you probably don't have much, but there are conversation data sets available, which I will show you in my next slides. In both of the ways, if you are not going to use generative models, like go completely on generative models, define intense entities, slots for the information you'd like to extract and send to backend. And the scenarios, you know, like the intent and action and intent and action sequences. <clears throat> And creating your training data, I'm going to I'm going to show you. Uh, there is this survey for the uh, data driven dialogue systems. There are machine to machine data. There is human to human conversational data. There is human to machine conversational data. Uh, it's it, I have given the link below and the paper below. Uh, you can, you know, use open subtitles if you're going to make a friend like chatbot that is actually useful. Uh, you can, what I have observed also is that if you don't think you are, that your data is actually enough, I have found a way that I have used, like, for instance, in my chatbot, I am using People are, people can ask questions like, what are the benefits of eating goji berry? Or what are the benefits of doing yoga? Or how many, uh, how many cups of water should I drink per day? So if you have questions like these and you, do, you probably don't have it in the open subtitles or any other conversational data sets, you can scrape them from SERP API. Uh, like, or you can simply Google them and, you know, similar questions appear. And then just, I have used this T5 model with fine-tuned on Quora question pairs to paraphrase the questions. Uh, like, for instance, in here, I say what to do when basement floods, which is a question for a service company. 
and you can just generate data. What should I do if my basement floods? How can I repair a basement flood, etc.? Because the real people have actually said it once, and it was trained on Quora, which actually is a nice way to augment your data if your data is small. But use there are also um, tools like Markdown tools, uh, which generates. You know, you give a template. Um, in here, it can be what to do when, and the basement flood is actually an entity. So it replaces that basement flood with other entities and generates data, but it creates a lot of bias when it comes to, you know, uh, when it comes to inference. And it um, and um, it's not, I don't really find it healthy. You can still use it though, but I don't really find it healthy. So I don't really use it that much. But it's good for you know um, POC and uh, MVP. Uh, so you have to think TFIDF. What I mean by TFIDF, uh, you need to you need your chatbot agent to make distinction between the intents as much as it can. So. What that means is that like reduce the number of um, common words between your intents and instead define entities like there I here I have given two different intents uh, called order pizza and order pasta. One is like I want to order this, I want to order that, you know, pizza entities. Other one is pretty much the same. So instead of doing this, have one uh have one intent called order food so that your model is not going to get confused like and include all of the food entities under that one instead of just uh splitting it up over the types of entities uh that actually helps these these are just little things but you can overlook uh from time to time which is uh, which is something i also do by the way <laughs> But it helps. Like you need to make them less similar and less similar. Um, so if you can also for the for the chatbots that don't have narrow domains, I highly recommend you to use embeddings. Like bird embeddings are quite useful. Uh, there are many. Uh, embedding choices it the, they don't you know like spacey for instance doesn't have much uh, for the non-english languages fast text is a bit heavy uh i wouldn't recommend that but byte pair embeddings i i i kind of like them because they're lightweight but using birds actually helps a lot bird embeddings uh if use them if you have a wide domain chatbot like a human friendish chatbot because like the word bank for instance like the easiest example ever can mean different things in different contexts uh, it's better if you train your own model with no embeddings if you have a narrow domain like a bank or food ordering chatbot or whatever uh, with narrow domain so that your embeddings are more i feel like your embeddings will be more better i have benchmarked it and i have seen that it the embeddings narrow the the embeddings perform better when it comes to white domain chatbots and also there is this concept called handling fallback which Probably most of you have observed when using a chatbot. So fallback is when your bot cannot recognize things well or recognizes them with a really uh, low confidence level. So what I would suggest is to go, you know, like do a cross validation after you train a model or train a model with cross validation, and then uh, go over the misclassified intents and then analyze their confidences and determine a fallback threshold, or you can simply you know, improve your worst performing intents and, uh, and then train again, and then analyze them again and determine a final fallback threshold. 
what happens when your bot hits the fallback threshold is that it's going to say something like, hey, please rephrase your question. I'm a bot. You can express it in a better way. You can, um, can you say it in simpler terms and stuff? But it tends to get boring when your bot says it, says it a lot. Uh, do you have a question, Abhishek? Yeah, so I, I guess this question fits um, here. Uh, so how do you handle an intent that is not in the classification output? And how do you use this information as a feedback for model training next time? So it's, it's, a, it's a cool question. I'm going to just touch on it. Um, so after I deal with this, so you have said something and both didn't understand it. Bot will ask you, you know, can you say it in a different way? And if it's going to, if, if, if it still cannot understand, then it's going to say, hey, can we try it one more time? You know, can you make it short? And you say it again, you know, you can just uh, redirect it to a human, which is usually the case. Uh, chatbots actually help you in times that, you want to um, expand your capabilities with fewer human life support agents, uh, not get them out of the way completely, but get them when your bot is actually struggling. Uh, or you can just redirect to buttons, uh, which is actually useful. But this one, like, uh, there is this commercial airline in here uh, that is quite professional and big, and they're like, they're one of the biggest airlines ever in here. Uh, I have seen their chatbot asking the same thing again and again and again, and it was, it was really a bad experience. You shouldn't do this. Like you should ask once and then ask in a different way. And if it still doesn't work, then redirect it to a human. This is called two-phase fallback, I guess. Like, give them two chances. And if it doesn't work, then just redirect them to human. Uh, so when it comes to this um, thing uh, for the for the uh, misclassified intents, you know, like if the user is not satisfied with what bot said, what you can do is just put a thumbs up and thumbs down in UI next to the message. And then, you know, a user can click it and it goes to your backend saying, hey, user didn't like the sensor. And you can just um, see what is going on over there. If you don't want to log your user messages, like logging is another thing. You know, there's GDPR constraints coming in. You can anonymize your user data for this, uh, if especially if you're making a chatbot that is a really wide domain because people can express anything. And it's if you are concerned with their privacy, then uh, it's a problem because you cannot log as much as you want. Uh, there are different logging uh, types for this, but you usually log uh, and you usually send the log confidence ones uh, to your backend and also send the thumbs down messages to your backend so that you can have a look after. Uh, why you shouldn't use generative models? So I have you seen this... Uh... <laughs> This is kind of sensitive. I have used, I have seen this chatbot that is like a human like chatbot that was using generative models that I'm not. Okay, it's using GPT 2 and 3. And it denies COVID vaccine, for instance, because it's most, you know, like it's, it's trained on Reddit. So it's going to be a bit sexist and racist. It's, it's really un <laughs> uncomfortable to speak about. I love it. I don't want anyone to take it out of it. Uh, but it's, it's a bit racist. And, you know, also the Western media used to be a bit, you know, 
woman is nurse and man is like computer science analyst, CEO, engineer stuff. Someone <laughs> made this paper called "Man is to computer programmer as woman is to a homemaker device in board and beddings and found out that you know women are more sassy and <laughs> sassy and nurse and dancer and men are more journeyman genius. I don't know better. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you to use generative models like take the hard way and go intent action way instead use a lot of markdown when you are crafting your answers like there are answers you define in the in the intent action chatbots for each intent like make them make a lot of answers that are in context but it's make them a lot and your bot can pick them randomly so that it doesn't see, seem repetitive. Do not make one answer for one intent, for instance, and plug plug things in, you know, like, you know, username and other stuff in the answer so that user will think that is actually a personal thing or the, you know, information you have gathered, like field slots, you know, a movie that user has has a fan of whatever so that user will think it's actually a personal you know nice friend i wouldn't suggest you to use um, generative models they are a bit biased they are best if you are if they are not used in customer facing applications like codex codex is actually customer facing but it's a different domain I mean, that's my opinion, and you are working in hugging face, like you probably have a better opinion. To transformer API. <laughs> yeah. It's about do you do you think these kind of generating the generative models can be combined with the intent classification model and the response that we have to generate something? better so like we don't use the generative models directly to respond to the questions but we uh, combine it with the intent classification model in some way and try to produce better responses yeah like it was a project we were developing like if the user likes um star wars for instance let's make it a generate you know fine-tune a generative model to talk about star wars that's why i said do not co go completely on generative models when you are making it but you know refer to it from time to time instead which is in my opinion better like if you receive this intent on you know i want to talk about star wars with you then just go for the generated model and then just conversate and come back. But I don't know if, if it would create, you know, uh, any uh, anything that is going to put the bot's image to jeopardy. Like they, they made this hospital bot and the user was saying, hey, I feel bad about my life and stuff. And it said, go kill yourself or something. Did you see it? It was fine. It was by GPT three, I guess. Did you see that one? Okay. So what you're saying is generative models are good, but uh, like when you're working in an industry, probably your intent based bots will perform much better. Uh, give, uh, rather than generative models and then there is also something called a liability yeah right so yeah. probably that's why we should not use uh, generative models at this yeah. stage but yeah i mean i share the same opinion as you uh, so we are going to hit the q a uh and then that's all but i want to like I received the questions as well. So how can I receive the questions, you know? Are you are going you to ask, ask to me? I also I want, want to see you because I feel like I'm talking to a wall and I really don't like it. Can I, can I?
Thank you very much for the talk. It was it was really very good. Uh, lots of things to learn and uh, people also liked it a lot. I have already asked you uh, many questions. So I think uh, one of the questions I have here is, is uh, instead of like you talked about the feedback mechanism when people give thumbs up or thumbs down, but we all know that when you when you get a survey, when someone asks you to fill a survey, do you always fill a survey? You don't. So a lot of people don't give thumbs up or thumbs down. So how would you, is there an automated way in which you know that, okay, this answer was not good? How, how would you approach this? I would directly take the fallback, the ones that fall into fallback, but the ones that are not falling into fallback, let me <laughs> let me think. I don't know. They also fall into sometimes um, core something we call dialogue management threshold in which your bot is not sure which action to bring next, meaning that the user might have gone far from the context. Maybe that's that's when you might think that the yes, this intent is misclassified. So this might be another case. Um, I, these are the three things I can think about. Do you have any, you know? So one of the examples I, that I have here is uh, some something like a use case that uh, uh, the chatbot returns. I will I will bring you a cold drink for order pizza intent. So intent should be order pizza. So if I understand it correctly, so if you have to like analyze these kind of issues uh, in an automated manner, I don't know. This is what I have observed so far. From I have also talked to many other chatbots uh, making folks, and this is what I get. There is probably a better way. There is a simpler way, but this is what I have observed and what I've been doing. I forgot the question. Like the, <clears throat> there might be problems that makes your bot uh, give a fallback. Um, might be like uh, doing a spell checking problem. Usually we use like engrams to prevent spell errors, but I have seen you know, Levenstein distance with fuzzy matching, which is, I think that it takes a while if you have a lot of training data. Uh, it, you can use it for entity uh, entity recognition. I have also, in my previous job, I have worked on uh, spell correction really closely. It is a hard problem to solve. I forgot to mention about that, so I just... Just that I, I just remembered it, and I just want to say there are like two different um, approaches. One is like frequency based, another one is the context based, and each have different problems. So yeah. True, I have uh, I I know about this problem. So uh, like one uh, one question is um, uh, let me let me take a look at the question again. I forgot. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, it's it's about how you got started with chatbots and what excites you the most about it and what do you think is the trickiest part of working with chatbots? I might sound like a nerd, but I love machine learning in general and making machines do things, it excites me. But the one thing <clears throat> I really liked is the movie Her from Scarlett Johnson and Joaquin Phoenix, where the man falls in love with this voice assistant. Uh, like ever since I watched it, I really wanted to become a, you know, like I need to develop this at some point. I loved it, but more I got into it, it how, that's how I realized it's a hard problem. Like when you're making a generic bot, for instance, one problem I have, seen is that you know pronouns like you need to get pronouns normally in document classification most of the time intent recognition is actually a document classification problem at core but for the document cross classification problem you need to get rid of the stop words and that's where i have seen that in generic bots most of the stop words aren't actually stop words <laughs> like 
pronouns, for instance. Um, and I have seen that, you know, when doing a generic chatbot, positional embeddings increase the, you know, all of your metrics by 20%, because pronouns are making a lot of difference. Like the way I say, I love you and you love me, like the response you need to give are two different things. And it's hard to make a distinction between them, like distinguish them and, you know, positional embeddings and other stuff, you know, you know, transformers architectures and they really helped. I just wanted to say that it's another thing I have observed in uh, when making different types of chatbots, the, the stop, how you pick your stop words actually matter a lot. How, how to go, so stop words like uh, not is also a stop word, right? So I do. In, you know, in most of the document classification problems, like Spacey have, has this stop word list and most of the people actually use it in document classification. We were also using it, but I have realized that it gets rid of pronouns. It gets, it's, um, it gets rid of some of the meaning, actually meaningful words, like alone, I don't know. Um, there are actually useful words in there, but we were getting rid of it and then I have refined it and just seen that it actually helped to refine. One, one question that I have is like negations. So yeah. how... <laughs> What would you suggest about like how to take care of negations? So in Raza, what they are doing is this, uh, there is multiple intents, something called multiple intents in which, you know, intent is about eating, for instance, and you have a positive, like a positive extension and a negative extension and a neutral extension. If you define it as a multiple, I'm really sorry noise there is let me show it uh, uh probably other um other frameworks have it as well like a sentence does not necessarily have to mean only one thing the user might have written a long sentence uh that contains many different things that you need to take action uh in a different way let me show you this. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. I just don't want to you to see the link of the talk. Uh, okay, you see, um, for instance, the user says to a question, can you, can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, sure. So user says, yes, can you give me suggestions on how to get there? So you have three different in two different intents in here, actually. One is yes, the affirmation. Like there is the separate uh, thing called affirmation is like, yes, I agree. Yes, do it, etc. And there is this another thing. Can you give me suggestions on how to get there? You have a transportation bot. So if you do not define it like affirmation plus ask transport, then it is going to be confused. Like you see in here, we have intent confidence rankings, okay? And the best prediction is the affirm plus ask transport. The other one is ask transport and the last one is thanks, goodbye, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's not only this, but if you, for instance, let's say you have defined your, um, and fallback threshold to be below 0 0.4, then it's going to fall into fallback, this one. Maybe it's not because this intent exists, but this might fall into fallback because this word called yes exists. It can be for anything. It can be for negation. So you need to, I feel like you need to define uh, every intent with affir both affirmation and the negation and neutrality, like, for instance, about food or about health in, in my context, you, you can say, I want to do yoga, how can I do it? You can say, you know, it's a positive thing, user wants to do yoga. There, you can say, 
uh, I want to know more about yoga. Can you tell me about yoga, which is a neutral thing? User wants to know something and you need to bring something from the KB. And the negative thing, user hates yoga. So if you define multiple intents, then it then it's going to make your life easier in you know handling negations and other stuff. But also um, because it's a multiple intent, you know the aff affirmation, you know like the positiveness and the separate neutral intent have you know like have so much in common. It actually recognizes multiple intents easier than any other intents because. There are two different things defined already, and you put them together in separate intent, yet it still recognizes it. Let's let's take a, a couple of more questions. We are sure. about time. So uh, this is a simple one. Um, can we get the slides of the presentation? Okay. I feel like Sometimes I feel like when I'm on these talks, I'm going to be asked something that I don't, <laughs> I cannot answer and I feel, I don't know, in confidence, but let's hit me, just hit me. Which slide is that? The question was if we, if you can share the slides with everyone. Oh, <laughs> I thought I was the slides. <laughs> Uh, okay, of course I can. By the way, do you, how do you handle negations? <laughs> See how the tables. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to answer that right now. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a difficult thing. Obviously, you cannot have negations for all the intents that you create, but probably you can do something with some kind of word list. Something I don't know. Okay. I don't know everything yet. So I'm I'm learning from your talk. So okay. Let's take one last question. Uh, or do we do we have? Uh, so so you have already discussed a little bit about rasa and dialogue flow. Uh, are there any situations in which you should prefer one over the other? Oh. Raza has this Raza open source and Raza enterprise. Raza open source is completely free and you can also contribute. Uh, what I have observed is that if your core product is actually a chatbot, like, I don't know, I, I, I hope you don't hear there is a background noise with, you know, call to prayer and stuff. Uh, so if you, if you, if your core product is actually a chatbot, I don't know um then companies tend to spend more effort on with their engineers on doing it and gather as much flexibility over the chatbot as they can uh that's why they are using raza open source like there is this banking bot called n26 you probably have used it they are using raza there is this uh, bot in us called lemonade uh it's also the core product is the chatbot but if your core product is not the chatbot and you don't want to spend too much time and engineering effort uh you can use dialog flow because it is it in it encapsulates many things you know you just press you know train and it trains in browser open source you can edit your hyperparameters do hyperparameter tuning uh do cross validation like there is a lot of options in the nlu part and the dialogue management part. I think that it's more flexible. That's why I would prefer Raza open source uh, other than other frameworks that are paid and they that encapsulate many things and engineering depth from you. So if, if you're a developer, then you would go for Raza. Okay, uh, great. Uh, let's take this last question, and uh, okay. this is more often. And I don't want to take time from your. I have free time, so you can ask me. <laughs> we usually keep the talk to one hour. Um, so the last question that we have for today is what? Uh, and if you if you guys have any more questions, you can follow more on Twitter, and. Uh, 
Hopefully she will respond. <laughs> so the last question is what kind of advice do you have to give for beginners if they want to go for building chatbots? So depending on the framework you would like to learn if you are going to be a developer of this, like this means that you are going to be the owner of it. Like you need to do in startups, like what I do right now is both the back end of the chatbot, the the NLU part, like many things at once. If you are going to be working at a startup, you probably need many skills. And if you're going to do this as a developer, I would suggest you to learn Raza open source. So there are masterclass uh, series of Raza online in YouTube. Uh, you can learn it from there if you are not if you if you want to make a simple bot and there are limited number of requests you just want to experience uh you can also take the, the google dialogue flow uh courses on coursera um i think there is uh auditing available or you can i don't know pay for it up to you uh, there is a lot of online resources out there but first define what you want to learn but they usually provide an abstraction like, you know, intents and entities and dialogue management are all the same thing. It's just the, the mechanism in working in the back, like uh, the NLU neural nets architecture or the dialogue management architecture are different. If you want to get to it, then learn in a platform specific way, but usually they all work the same. Some uh, encapsulate functionalities and some don't. Okay, that, yeah, that's a great answer. And uh, with this, I would uh, I, I won't take any more time of yours. And I think it's people. A, you can also ask me from Twitter if you want. Sure. <laughs> so what what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, I'm going to share your social media links. And uh, if you can send me the link to the presentation, I will also share that in the pinned comment. So if you have any further questions, you can connect with Merv on Twitter or on LinkedIn and uh, you can ask her. And uh, with thank that, so with that, I would like to thank Merv for joining today. And thank you so much for taking the time out. And I love the talk and everyone else also love the talk and uh, see you guys next time.